afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for coming. I'm Maren Lead at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and I am very pleased to welcome Brigadier General Bill Mullen III, the Director of the Capabilities Development Directorate down at Marine Corps Combat Development Command. Um, he has a uh, longer than he looks, this very distinguished career, uh, command at multiple levels, uh, most recently served as the president of Marine Corps University before taking his current assignment. He's been the uh, Marine aide to the president. He's done numerous uh, operational uh, jobs to include a, a slew of counter-narcotics missions and uh, all kinds of interesting things, um, and is now trying to uh, chart the path forward for Marine Corps capabilities on a number of fronts to include connectors, uh, a key part of the Marine Corps capability as a whole. And so uh, we asked him to come today to talk a little bit about where they're going with connectors. They've been uh, getting a lot of attention on that subject for the last few years and um, have recently made a few decisions about the way ahead. So uh, General Mullen, thanks very much for taking the time to come talk with us today. And um, I'll, I'll probably let you make a few minutes of remarks and then we yes, can please. open it up for questions. If people could uh, check their phones and put them on silent if you would. And then also to people who may be watching on the web, uh, if you'd like to send questions by email, you can do so by sending them to me at mlead, M-L-E-E-D, at C-S-I-S dot O-R-G. Um, and I'll try to inject them into the conversation. And we'll try to get to a conversation with all of you shortly. Great. Well, it's good to be here today. Um, thanks for your time. And, uh, you know, what do I know about capability development? That's the question I asked about a year ago when I was putting into it, and the answer was zip. And, uh, but what I do know is operational requirements and the things that we need to be able to do out there. And uh, that's why I was put into this job. And um, I tell you, it's been quite a learning experience, and uh, especially learning the acquisition process and all the things that are required there. Uh, we're in a state of flux right now, as you probably can imagine. There's a lot of things going on, all in the face of a pretty significant uh, fiscally constrained environment. So how are we going forward? How are we, how are we enabling ourselves to be able to do something like an amphibious operation, which can be anywhere from disaster relief all the way to the high end, uh, which we believe we won't do, but we have to have the capability to do. Uh, you know, one of the things we talked about at lunch there was uh, there's a lot of people that point to something like what you saw in the Pacific series, the HBO series Pacific, as, well, the United States will never do that again. We have no intention. We don't want to do that again. That's not how we want to conduct operations. We want to go where somebody is not. Uh, the problem we have is we have to have the ability to do that if it's absolutely required. Because if you don't have a credible ability to do that, that starts limiting your options. And if your options start to get limited, then that gives people that don't like you very much uh, room to maneuver and do things that they wouldn't normally do because they have in the back of their mind thinking, well, what's the United States going to do about this? And all I'm talking about here is capability. I'm not talking about will, I'm not talking about anything else. It's the capability to do these things. Again, I'm a capability development guy. I have to look at what the Marine Corps is able to do and not able to do and figure out if we can't do something, what do we do to make sure uh, that we get that ability? How do we fill that gap? And of course, it all starts with requirements. What is the requirement? And we had a pretty good discussion at lunch about concepts and requirements. The hard part is you nail down a concept, you lay something out, and the rug can get pulled under you pretty quickly by some folks saying, no, you'll never do that. Don't, don't use that as a concept. It's never going to happen. So those are some of the challenges we're facing right now. Uh, in this fiscal constrained environment, as you well know, we've pursued for a long time the ability to have a high water speed vehicle. It's technically feasible to do that. Pretty doggone expensive. That's not a good thing these days, and, and not for years to come. But it's also very, very complex. And due to the weight restrictions, it can't be above a certain weight or else you're not getting a high water speed vehicle. It's a low water speed vehicle. Um, you have to keep below a certain weight, which means less, less lethality and less armor on the thing. So the alternative we come up with is a program that we're already working on, the military per, uh, marine personnel carrier, which has some ability to swim. How much, we don't know. It has to be proven has to be tested, but the engineering specifications we're looking at indicate it may be as good as the AAV. Has to be proven, though. So then what? So then what? 
especially if you need, if the requirement is to come in from a, a much greater distance, which based on the A2 threat that we're seeing out there, we probably have to do something from much greater distance, not an entire amphibious operation. We have to have the ability to do something. Maybe it's nothing more than a company landing team that we put ashore, either via V-22s or a combination of V-22s and connectors that can get us into the general vicinity. Because the connectors we have, the LCACs, the LCUs, the joint high-speed vessel, none of those things will go into an unprotected beach. Even if there's somebody just with, you know, not the, the high-end spectrum, but even if somebody as simple as an RPG or maybe a machine gun or something, they're not gonna put something in an unprotected beach which tells us we have to have the ability to have that thing bring us into just outside small arms range and then get off it and swim ashore via our own means. Now, whether the vehicle we're looking at right now can do that, we don't know. It has to be proven. The connectors, that's a challenge. The Navy's replacing the LCAC program, they're slepping them, and they're starting a program to replace them. They're just getting underway a program to replace the LCUs because we have some that are as old as 54 years old. LCUs carry a lot, but they're very slow. LCACs don't carry much, but they're very fast. So we're also looking at other options out there. We held a connector summit in March. What are some of the other uh, potentials out there? Right now, there's a half-scale model of something called the Ultra Heavy Amphibious Connector, UHAC. It's the screwiest looking thing I've ever seen. But one of the things it has the potential to do that half size model is proving out is it can carry about as much as an LCU and go about two thirds as fast as an LCAC. And it's the same size as an LCAC. That sounds fairly good. We're looking at other things out there. In the 1980s, the Marine Corps tested something called the HAVIC, the Havoc. It's an aluminum sled, self-propelled aluminum sled. Vehicle drives on, uh, there's a control console that the driver of that vehicle controls uh, the thing can get up to about 20 to 25 knots. Don't know what the range is on it. It gets ashore. You drive off it, leave it. Beach group picks it up. That's an idea. That's something out there that has been tested in the past. Uh, the uh, prototype that was developed was scrapped in the 1990s. Uh, what's the potential there? We don't know, but we're going to explore it. There's other options out there also that have been presented to us. We put out a, a white paper asking for uh, people's ideas, what do you think? What are some other things we might be able to do? Because we understand we have a challenge. We're also looking to work it with alternative platforms. That was part of the discussion at lunch. Uh, the Navy in particular, because of limitations on what they're able to do with gray-hulled ships from the standpoint of how many they're gonna have and some of the maintenance issues they're having, they're asking us to look at more alternative methods of using some of these ships. People in this crowd probably know some of those limitations better than I do, but I tell you, uh, we are looking at it, but very cautiously, because one of the things we have to make sure of is we still need those gray hulled ships. They can't replace, anything we do alternatively can't replace any of those gray hulled ships. And uh, part of that discussion is we need 38. We understand in a fiscally constrained environment, we'll accept 33. Uh, due to maintenance issues and other issues going on right now, we have less than that. And we work very closely with the Navy trying to improve that situation. So I probably talked enough, and uh, I would like to, I'd like to know what you want to know. So here to have tomatoes thrown at me. <laughs> Marin promised I'd get tomatoes. <laughs> um, let me start with something a little bit more benign, maybe an apple. Oh, um, an apple, nice. Yeah. Not a softball, but. Okay. Um, so one of the Marine Corps' critical challenges is one shared by the Army of protection and weight. Um, Absolutely. And the Army is putting a lot of emphasis on material development and, and really trying to break that uh, that relationship, that relationship of physics. It seems like the Marine Corps is less focused on that objective. I mean, clearly you have an interest in the capability, but, but the Marine Corps doesn't talk as much about material development as a potential solution to that. Is the Marine Corps um, participating in any way supportive of what the Army's trying to do in that space, um, or are they just sort of trying to let the Army lead and, and focus on other things. How well, you... we're watching very closely what the Army does because in many ways we try and piggyback off right. of some of their efforts, a perfect example being the joint light tactical vehicle. Uh, but because we're involved in it, that vehicle's lighter, that vehicle has lower, is able to lower itself because our requirements are it has to be able to fit on a ship. Right. And in certain areas of the ship, you know, you can't go above 76 inches. Uh, if we weren't involved in that program, those restrictions wouldn't be there because the Army doesn't, 
really isn't concerned about those kind of things. We're nowhere near as much as we are. So that's part of the issue in what we're looking at. Um, but a lot of the vehicles tend to be bigger, heavier, uh, and they rely on them much more heavily than we do. Um, our emphasis has been not so much fighting with those vehicles, but fighting from those vehicles uh, to be able to use as armored protected transport. Uh, and we don't necessarily, you know, like our AAV, we've never used that as an, or as an armored fighting vehicle, unlike the, the Army, which is, who has used the Bradley as an armored fighting vehicle. So those are some of the differences uh, in our approach to things. But where we can work with the Army to be able to, you know, they have obviously much deeper pockets than we do in their ability to uh, investigate things, uh, do their RDT and E, uh, to develop things. Um, where we can, we use that, but again, our interests are not all that closely uh, aligned. Um, so we were talking earlier also about the mobile landing platform, which is a, a concept that has changed or evolved over time um, and now envisioned as two versions, MLP one and two, and, and then three and four, with, which are pretty different. Yeah, they're, the um, three and four are, con are considered a, an afloat forward staging base, and they have, it's the same general hull of the ship, but what they put on is a very large flight deck that goes pretty much across the entire uh, middle part of that ship, whereas the MLPs, they essentially, they're an oil tanker that has uh, had the middle cut out of them to be able to enable a ship to pull, up, pull alongside, marry up, put a ramp down, have vehicles drive off that ship onto the MLP, and then load onto LCACs that can come in uh, and operate off of that MLP. Um, they can't be transported by that MLP, but they can operate from them. Load on, have the vehicles load onto those LCACs, and they depart. And that's actually the first ones, uh, they're proving that concept out in uh, California right now, because uh, the first one's actually doing that. The afloat forward staging base, number three, uh, the MLP-3 is actually being finished up right now, it's the puller. Um, they, we were just out uh, about two months ago, and they were just getting ready to put the flight deck on. And um, that should be pretty versatile. And uh, now our big question is, is it going to be able to work with B-22s? And I know that's one of the issues they're focusing on to try and make sure that it can. Um, I, I don't know if it can or not, I haven't heard yet. Okay. Um, let me open it up to audience questions. Um, Anybody, and I'll keep going, go ahead. Um, let's wait for the microphone if you would so we can capture it for everyone. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Megan Eckstein with Defense Daily. Um, as you look at the future of connectors, um, I mean, right now with the uh, ACV, you have sort of uncertain swim capabilities. Yes. Um, the Commandant has sort of said, you know, the concept of operations are unknown and possibly MLP will play a role. So. It's hard. I mean, I guess I'm wondering how you guys are able to determine what the LCU replacement or any other connectors might look like when there are so many variables right now and how these things will be operating. Yeah. The LCU replacement and the LCAC replacement, or the LCAC replacement, which is called the Surface uh, uh, SSC, I'm, acronyms escaping me, there's too many acronyms. Um, the SSC, they're essentially going to be a little bit more capable than what we have right now, it's, but it's, it's, it's going to be a very, very similar vehicle. Because the driving factor on those things is, first of all, speed. So you know you, you can't put too much weight on them. But the second part is being able to fit in the well decks of the ships we currently have and we're anticipated to have in the future. So that's what's driving those capabilities. One of the things we're asking if they can do is to be able to do an in-stream launch with these vehicles. Uh, and the old LCAC uh, demonstrated that in 1988, 87 or 88, demonstrated the ability with AAVs, very slow, laborious process. Um, but we want those ships to be able to, have those vessels to have the same capability. Um, my understanding is with the, the SSC, uh, we probably won't be able to get that capability until about the 10th one because they've already started manufacturing the first, uh, I believe, eight. Uh, so we, can't, we don't want to change any design. We don't want to, you know, we're not trying to impact that program, but we ask them where possible, can we make modifications, engineering modifications that will enable us to be able to launch off of those things? Because as I said, you know, we have to have the ability to do that because those things aren't going to go into an undefended beach. And if we're coming from much further out, we, there is no vehicle that'll swim from that range. Even the high water speed uh, EFV that we were anticipating, uh, it, 25 nautical miles is about the extent of it. And then you start doing that thing called running out of gas. And that's bad. Other questions? Go ahead. Hi, I'm Scott Masioni with Inside the Pentagon. 
Um, I was just curious as to, you know, you, you talked about this a little bit before, what you're doing in kind of in the short term, but what are you doing right now to improve connectors and, and getting to shore, you know, upgrade-wise or are any modifications on, on the vehicles? Uh, right now, we're not, I mean, we're, we're working with what we have because anytime you come up with a new idea, it takes years to actually implement. And so right now what we're doing is uh, our AAVs are not very capable. We're having problems with them. You know, the, some of them are, uh, were first entered service in 1972. So what we're trying to emphasize with those is a program where we're doing a limited force protection upgrade and a systems improvement to it, but it takes time. We're not actually gonna be able to start modifying, turning wrenches on those vehicles till FY19, just because of the way the, these programs work, because they have to test things out. Uh, there's the engineering piece of it. Um, there's just so many different things involved that you can't actually, you know, that's the kind of lead time we're talking about just to modify vehicles that we have right now. Um, so, you know, we're doing what we can. Um, those vehicles, uh, we have issues with them launching, you know, outside of three miles. Um, they're just old and we're facing parts obsolescence, um, but it's what we have and, uh, you know, they've, they get the job done one way or another for what we're doing right now. And our emphasis right now in particular especially with the, in the currently fiscal and screen environment, uh, our commandant's priorities are crisis response at the expense of major combat operations. If we absolutely had to do it, we certainly would, uh, but it'd, it'd be a stretch. But right now we're focused on crisis response. And uh, that's, you know, our, the capabilities we need to do crisis response aren't as robust as what we need to do major combat operations. Okay. Just one back there and then we'll come up here. Good afternoon, sir. Yolanda Peterson-Jones from CNA. And I wanted to know if uh, you had any concerns or issues um, with the new system that could pose delays with the ACV meeting operational requirements, um, meaning uh, delays such as weather-related, um, sea wave height, um, that kind of thing. And um, are there any concerns with the distance that the uh, assets would be launched from, sh to, yeah. from ship to shore? Well, right now what our intentions are is we're going to do a limited buy first, uh, and we're calling that 1.1. And the idea behind that is to get it out, get it operating, we'll obviously test it, make sure it's safe to operate, but we're gonna get it out to the operating forces, let the Marines use them, while still the majority of our fleet are the AAVs, and tell us what needs to change. You know, what works, what doesn't work, what are the limitations on this thing? And then we make changes to 1.2, and then we buy to about half of our requirement with 1.2. And so what the, the considerations you just mentioned, well, first of all, we have to prove that it even swims in the first place. Uh, I mean, we don't know that for sure. Engineering specifications have indicated to us that it does, but we don't know that for sure. And we can't actually say it does, you know, definitely does, until it's been tested and proven. Um, so once we have tested and proven that, then we start looking at the limit, you know, okay, what are the exact limitations as to how far it can go, what it can do, and then the idea behind it, though, is 1.1, we don't intend to change very much because we need to get it as quickly as possible and start operating with it because, as I explained, our AVs are getting very, very old. So that's some of the, you know, if it's not able to do much, uh, then the engineering change proposals for the second group of vehicles that we're going to buy need to improve our ability to do some of those things. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Hi, sir. Sidney Friedberg from BreakingDefense.com. Uh, you mentioned the emphasis on the crisis response on the lower end of the spectrum or even the non-shooting operations where you also need amphibious capability rather than you know, the World War III scenarios. But if you, one of the things that everyone's very concerned about is if you look at low end or hybrid or non-state threats, that things like RPGs, uh, like roadside bombs, often with homemade explosives, uh, even drones yes. uh, to some degree, absolutely, cyber for heaven's sake, all sorts of things are proliferating down from you know the state actors to some very low-level groups that may well pop up as spoilers in a uh, humanitarian relief operation, Absolutely. for example. So, you know, without going into the full air-sea battle dimension of things, how do you in these more m modest operations create an amphibious force uh, that is survivable uh, yeah. and effective 
you know, without breaking the bank, as yeah. of course. Are well, that's the thing. Is that's something we've been watching very, very closely, because we are operating under the assumption that no matter where we go, no matter what we do, we have to always be looking over our shoulder, watching for people that don't like us very much, using that as an opportunity to cause casualties, to embarrass the United States. Uh, that can happen anywhere. Uh, in the most mundane of operations. Uh, we call it force protection. We're always emphasizing force protection. One of the reasons the Commandant chose to go the path that we're on right now is because this armored or this amphibious combat vehicle uh, has much higher ground clearance. It has a V-shaped hull. Uh, it has the ability to have wheels blown off and keep going. Uh, it's designed to operate more like an MRAP uh, than a tracked vehicle is. Uh, frankly, we had such problems with our AAVs in Iraq that we stopped using them outside the gate. We never even took them to Afghanistan. So that's some of the adjustments we made because of exactly the points you just brought up. I mean, the, the current operating environment and the anticipated operating environment, we think we're going to have to face all of those things. And, you know, technology is getting cheaper and more widely available, and we're very concerned about it. And uh, that's some of the reasons why we're going in the direction we're going. Yeah, the, we're being driven for good reason uh, by the Department of Defense to go to things like net, uh, network on the move, NOTM, NOTM. That's a requirement in our vehicles. Um, something else that's be, uh, becoming a requirement in our vehicles is energy efficiency. Uh, so all of these things combined contribute towards the approach that we're taking. Um, let's go here and then here. I'm Terry Murphy with CSIS and once upon a time an amphibious officer and got the Marines ashore. Uh, my question is, is a broader one. It's, I, I, this is way above my technical pay grade. How is the Marine Corps dealing with the cultural shift, if you like, if there is a cultural shift, from many, many years of war? I you know junior officers in Fallujah and I think I knew your former commanding officer of the 6th Marines. But in any event, 10 years of short desert, et cetera, et cetera. How's the culture of the Marine Corps shifting to being, in effect, expeditionary? It's, it's hard. Um, we've never gotten away from the expeditionary aspect. Um, we've not had it anywhere near as much emphasis on it as we have in the past. Um, essentially, we did what was required of us in Iraq and Afghanistan. Early on, I was actually on the Joint Staff, and I heard a conversation going on with regards to Iraq. You know, we had to march up, Marines went home. And Secretary Rumsfeld asked, well, what do you mean you went home? This is the war that's on. Why aren't you there? And the reply was, well, that's, you know, we don't do the longer term stuff. That's, that's what the Army's good at. That's what their focus is. And the response was, thanks for your international offense. Get over there. So we did. And I think we did fairly well. Um, we did what was required of us. Uh, now there's a large generation of our younger Marines that that's the only experience they have is operating in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so the Commandant has focused very heavily on that and from the standpoint of, okay, what we need to do is go back to our amphibious roots, go back to our expeditionary roots. Guess what? You're not going to have a green beans coffee everywhere you go from now on. And you have to have the ability to respond to, to crisis, the full scale, you know, all the way from passing out MREs to dealing with people that don't like us very much and are willing to try and hurt us or try and embarrass us or anything. Um, so, and that's, you know, one of the things we're doing right now is uh, in the 1940s, we had something called the Small Wars Manual. And we're putting out a supplement to that. We're calling the Small Wars Manual for the 21st century. Because what we don't want to do is forget the lessons we've learned over the last 10 to 12 years. We need to make sure those are inculcated throughout our operating forces. Because as we've talked about, some of the things we face there, we're going to face in a lot of other places. It's going to be, a lot of aspects are going to be different. Some things aren't going to be that different. We have to be ready to face those things. Frankly, people don't like us very much. Uh, they found out that things like IEDs and, and you know, now drones and some other things, they work pretty well. So we're, we're going to have to deal with those kind of things. And our Marines understand that. So that cultural shift from, OK, we're not doing that anymore. Now we're going back out on ships. We're putting out special uh, purpose mag tests for crisis response reasons. Um, and we're going to respond to whatever we're faced with. We need to be able to come up with an array of options for the decision makers. And that's what we're trying to do. Morning, sir. George Nicholson, a consultant for special operations and counterterrorism. I was at a session this morning with General Amos, and he started talking about his decision to cancel the EFV. Yes, sir. And he said, like you alluded to, it was a matter of cost and survivability. And he said the flat bottom, 
He said, I'm not about to explain to the mothers or fathers or sons or daughters why somebody was killed using that vehicle. And uh, he indicated it. Even if I had the fully fielded EFE today, I would not have put it into Afghanistan, or I wouldn't, because, like you alluded to, 90% of the use is not going to be on the on the ground. He also talked about, though, that there are off-the-shelf uh, solutions that the Marine Corps are looking at right now. Certain vehicles that are off the shelf right now that have got uh, almost 63% more protected capability than the NRAP. Can you talk to that? Yes, sir. That's essentially the, the amphibious combat vehicle capability that we're going after. Um, I've been counseled that using the words off the shelf isn't necessarily accurate by our systems command folks. They're calling it non-developmental. Um, which means, in my mind, is we have, to, we have to keep control of the requirements for those vehicles, not let them go anywhere in order to get that first group of vehicle out there. That, our emphasis is on that that's got to be a good enough to operate vehicle, not 100% of our requirement. We're looking for good enough. 1.2 will be a much better vehicle. What happens beyond that, it may be a high water speed ACV. It may be a 1.3 version as we vehicle. We don't know. What we do know is something has to change in the technology for a high water speed vehicle for, to enable us to do that uh, at unacceptable cost. Uh, when you start trading things away like armor, um, lethality, uh, that's a problem. And one of the things we found kind of inadvertently in Iraq was our seven ton trucks were much more survivable against IEDs. Why? That's not what they were designed for. It was something as simple as the ground clearance. You had higher ground clearance, you, so you had a little bit of offset. MRAPs, offset V-shaped hull to try and deflect the blast a little bit. Now there's some folks going back and second guessing whether the, the hull form actually does deflect the blast. I personally think it does, but I'm not an engineer. What do I know? Um, so that's why we're emphasizing this ACV because it has, out in the Nevada Automotive Test Center, they tested our technology demonstrator for the MPC. Uh, and industry followed that all the developments on that. And some of the things they developed in that thing is something like called inline drive, so that all four tires on each side pull about the same way tracks pull to be able to climb over things and maneuver in soft soil, mud, sand, that kind of thing. Um, but more importantly, you have higher level ground clearance. It can raise and lower itself. Uh, and then you have central tire inflation. And then you have a V-shaped hull. And then you have independent suspension so that when one of those tires gets blown off, it can drive itself out of the kill zone. Track vehicle, you blow a track, you're not going anywhere unless somebody tows you out or something. Um, so all those things combined, and there are a lot of different things. You know, there's the operational, there's the, the operational availability of those vehicles, the complexity. Um, frankly, the high water speed vehicle was very, very complex. There was a lot of hydraulics in it. Um, so, and the reliability was getting better by the time the program was canceled, but it still wasn't very good. Uh, that, that's a challenge. Fuel efficiency. I mean, those, it's a massive engine inside those to be able to drive it at that high speed. And some people say you're sucking fuel about the same way you do with an M1 tank. That's not good. So, I mean, all of those things combined are what contributed to the decision that the Commandant made and to take this different path. And in some ways, those, it's, it's something we always intended to do because the MPC we started developing in 2008 is a complementary capability. And our original intentions for that vehicle had nothing to do with uh, any more than swimming from shore to shore, you know, in calm water. So we didn't really discuss anything other than that because that's all we wanted the vehicle to be able to do. We'd get it ashore and then we'd use it ashore. Well, in talking with some of the industry representatives at Modern Day Marine and a couple of other events, uh, you know, you ask them, well, why didn't you bring up the fact that your vehicle swims? Well, it wasn't one of the requirements, so we didn't, we didn't talk about it. Well, does it swim? And they show you a video. Okay, well, that doesn't prove anything. I mean, it, it, you see the vehicle swimming in the water. Obviously, it has to be tested. So you start looking at the engineering specifications, reserve buoyancy, ability to right itself, all those kind of things, uh, thrust through the water to be able to get through the surf zone, the ability to keep itself from sinking once it comes off the ship. Indications we have is it's pretty good, but it has to be proven. Sir, Byron Callen, Capital Alpha Partners. I wonder if you can talk a little about the international aspects of some of these connector programs. There are a number of other countries that operate AAVs. They're probably as long as the tooth of some of ours. Um, they're is, buying some of ours, so I guarantee they're as long as tooth. <laughs> okay, but I'm curious. I mean, are they engaging in the requirements, or what, what's kind of the state of dialogue with uh, the requirements that you're setting, and how, how maybe well, partners might fit into yeah, those in the future? Uh, the, 
one of the things about it is we haven't really started discussing outside, you know, international. Uh, we've looked around at who's doing what. Um, and right now, the only people that have built a high water speed uh, amphibious uh, vehicle are the Chinese. And guess what? It looks a lot like the EV. Um, now, the, the specifications for it, we, we don't know all of them. But what it looked like they did was to solve, to get around the weight problem was put armor on the front, you know, for the frontal facing, and then sides and back, much, much lighter armor. I think you can take that with a BB gun. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> We also don't know what they have in the back of it from the standpoint of you know, how you fit the people in the back. Because the other thing about the ACVs that we're looking at, uh, they have mine resistant blast seats, so they're suspended from the ceiling, and they, you know, so they don't, the, the troops sitting in there don't absorb the seat, the blast coming up through their legs and through their spines. I don't know if they did anything like that in those vehicles. It goes very fast through the water. We don't know how far, and we don't know what happened when it gets ashore. We don't know what the reliability is. All of the challenges that we face. But like I said, looks a lot like the EFV had different paint scheme. Um, what a lot of other countries are doing with their amphibious vehicles is using the international versions of the ones we're looking at right now as potential vendors. That's what they're using for amphibious vehicles. They swim off the ship, they come ashore, um, they use different options. Uh, there's also the option that the French just did uh, in Mali. Uh, they wanted to operate in Mali, so they pulled a ship into port in Senegal, drove off onto the pier, drove, off, drove across Senegal, went into Mali to operate. Can we do that? I don't know. Obviously, there's a lot of permissions involved in that, um, but that's uh, that's a potential also. Try to do have a you know drive hundreds of miles of track vehicles doesn't work too well, especially with our old. You, you leave a bunch of them by the side of the road, and that's not considered a good thing. So, uh, one of the broader trade spaces that has been uh, being navigated of late in the Marine Corps is between the air element and the ground element. Um, and clearly, um, the V-22 is, is I, at least from where I sit, proving out to be a lot, of, a lot of what the Marine Corps promised and no one believed initially is now sort of coming to bear. And, I think it's going beyond our uh, expectations. So. And you know, the Marine Corps always said, you know, just wait till we get it out there and it'll, it'll be even better. And, and uh, again, uh, it actually looks like perhaps the Marine Corps was right. But, um, uh, that promise, I think, has, has to some degree reinvigorated the debate about, okay, how much of the ground element do we really need? How much, you, how much could you do relying more heavily on air? How relevant is the ground element uh, coming ashore? So how do you think about that balance? And Well, there, that's just it. There has to be a balance. Because but it, can it be a 75-25 balance, no, one I, way or the other? Because the thing about it is, whatever you bring in via air, hmm. um, right now we have an internally transportable vehicle, uh, but you have to make some modification before, before you put it on a V-22, hmm. and then to get it off, modify it again before you can operate with it. Um, and we're, we have a limited number of those. Other than that, those people are restricted to walking. And if you have a fairly robust anti-air threat, you have to do a lot to be able to tamp that down before you bring the B-22 in, um, and, or before you bring helicopters in with suspended vehicles underneath them, like our 53 uh, can carry quite a bit. Uh, the JLTV that we're bringing online, the 53 can actually carry two of them. Uh, and so that's another way to you know, sling load them in, to be able to bring those in. But you have to have a relatively benign environment to do that, uh, because you have to have the ability to move more than just at foot speed. And that's a challenge. And that's why I believe the ground element has to have the ability to get ashore with vehicles that are protected by armor um, and can fight. And uh, so that's, and then our bigger things, there's the only way to get them ashore uh, or the only way to get them in somewhere is via ship. Uh, because even the C-17, like we can only fly, you can only put one tank at a time on a C-17. So those are very limited options. Well, and uh, there are also the arguments about just exactly what the right balance is of the self-deployment. You've talked a, a lot about that, but do, do you see the potential for some technological evolution that might uh, shift that need and or will, could, could you see a financial scenario coming to pass that would essentially make that, uh, make, force the Marine Corps to conceive of that differently? I would not, I'd, I'd never say never, because as soon as you do that, you get proven wrong. Um, but I can't, I, I don't see it. 
um, because you know we're a ground centric organization. We have our air air assets to support. Well, I don't mean on the ground, but I mean in terms of of having a connector that just delivers, as opposed to having a self deployed capability, surface capability. Um, can you see? Uh, it's a lot easier to, in some ways, to put a vehicle onto a surface connector and drive it off than having the self-deployed and getting that right. balance of protection ashore versus speed in the water um, obviously is where is a but, petard you've been hoisted on before. Right. But so, the, the, to us, we see the ability to have an independent deployer that swims ashore without any, any connector uh, is a service-defining capability. And that's why we put so much emphasis on it. I mean, uh, you know, for our high, the pursuit of high water speed, uh, we've spent, you know, 26 years, $3 billion. And as I think I said at lunch, you know, it's not because we're stupid. Um, it's because that's how important it is to us to be able to have that capability. And that remains a requirement and a cap uh, to have that capability uh, as, and why we're continuing to pursue other options. And at the same time, continuing the pursuit of high water speed in tech, uh, technology, RDT&E, because the equation has to change somewhat so there's less trade-offs to be able to get that vehicle because that's ultimately what we would like. Because what we've envisioned is, for the longest time, and I think General Krulak and maybe uh, General Clark, if I'm wrong, and maybe since before him, a three-legged stool, V-22, LCAC, high water speed, AAV. it was called a triple AV, then it became EFV, um, and then we referred to it as a high water speed ACV when the high water speed study office was stood up. Uh, but that's, that's what we're trying to get to because we believe that gives us the most capability. Okay, more questions out there? Somebody's got to have some tomatoes. We haven't gotten the tomatoes yet. Here we go. Dakota, help us out with some tomatoes. Dak he won't do Dakota's it. always good I for tomatoes. He won't do a tomato. Uh, Dakota Wood, uh, Heritage Foundation. Um, the conversation has really been about the ACV, whatever variant. Uh, the topic was connectors. Um, and, and oftentimes when I read uh, about the topic or hear people talk about it, they conflate connectors, zip to shore connectors, with the ACV program. But really it's... LCAC, LCAC replacement, LCU, LCU replacement. Uh, you got to get JLTV ashore, you got to get Humvees ashore, you got to get MTVRs ashore. I mean, so what can you tell us about the CORE's uh, program or desires for actual surface connectors and reliance on Navy programs and the timeline for all that? Yeah, that's, I, I think, uh, I think I talked about it earlier, uh, or maybe I'm confusing what I talked about at lunch. We had a uh, summit in March to talk about all the different ideas that are out there because one of the things we clearly understand is with the route we're taking, LCUs and LCACs probably aren't gonna be enough. What else is there out there? What else can be done? The joint high-speed vessel that's just coming online, um, they're, we're gonna build eventually 10 of them and uh, the first two, uh, first three have already been commissioned and two of them are out there operating right now to find out, well, what all can we do with these vehicles, excuse me, these vessels? Uh, High-speed catamaran can up to 35 knots, can carry uh, over 600 tons. Um, pretty capable vehicle, except that that's not a landing vessel. Um, so one of the things we talked about is having a ramp. We're working with the ONR right now, Office of Naval Research, to see if we can do a ramp uh, that we can launch vehicles off. They drive off into the water instead of driving off onto an MLP or driving off onto a pier. Uh, so you load those up from much greater distance that can carry about 20 to 21 of the ACVs, bring them into just outside small arm range and let them drive off and swim ashore. Those are some potential options. Again, all of it has to be proven. Uh, we have to work these things out. But one of the things that we clearly realize is as the fiscal environment gets more and more constrained, we have to think harder. What are the alternatives? What else can we do to be able to make sure that we continue to have the capability to do amphibious operations? Because that's what makes us different, we believe. I saw another hand out there. Yeah, Sydney? No, wait till wait for the mic to see. Expeditionary Force 21 uh, recently came out. And obviously, you know, the connectors and the ACV and the whole ground component are you know, one, of the, one of the prongs of that trident, as it were. Uh, talk to me if you would, about how whatever replaces LCAC and LCU and you know, some of these innovative brand new platforms fit into a context of a world where 
you know, people are firing off anti-ship cruise missiles, possibly even non-state actors, as we've seen in Lebanon, firing off anti-ship cruise missiles. Uh, you know, and have, may, you, know, you can buy free long-range radars uh, off the internet now. So how do those connectors, uh, you know, yes, I understand the Navy doesn't want to bring them within small arms range, but, you know, how, they, how about getting them through that cruise missile envelope? Uh, which more and more adversaries are going to be able to generate to some degree. Absolutely. Well, that, that's the thing is what I don't want to give people the idea is that we'd be doing this by ourselves. Obviously, we'd be doing this with the Navy, and the Navy's put a great, the Navy and the Air Force, the Navy and the Air Force put a great deal of time and effort into the anti-access fight to be able to suppress that. One of the things we believe, though, is we can't just sit, stand by, and wait until we get the green light, okay, now it's safe to go ashore or safe to get within range to be able to go ashore. We believe that we have to be able to contribute to those shaping operations, even if it's nothing more than launching from quite a ways out, beyond 65 nautical miles out, via a form of connector that can get us ashore fairly quickly, uh, be able to come, you know, like with a joint high-speed vessel, be able to come just outside small arms range to be able to get these vehicles to swim off and then swim ashore and be able to open up a bubble ashore because one of the concerns I have is, much like the scud hunting in uh, Iraq in the first Gulf War, was aircraft can't see everything. Radar can't sense everything. They can shut themselves down, they can camouflage themselves, and they can pop up at the least convenient time. If you have people on the ground looking for those things, to be able to open up a window opportunity, uh, then you can help with that effort of bringing things closer in, but it's very much going to be a joint fight. We would not be, the, that's how we would see operating from much longer range. Uh, and that's, we think, is something we have to be able to do. Satisfy the question? Still, there's, there's, it's hard for me to see a JHSV type vessel, for example, you know, riding bravely through a, through a, a cruise, anti-ship cruise missile defense zone. Right. Well, uh, you wouldn't, we wouldn't just blithely go into that. <laughs> um, but when the alternative is, if, we, if this is something we absolutely have to do, and if you think about that environment, you know, there'd have to be a great deal, you know, the, the stakes would have to be very, very high. The objective would have to be a tremendously important, vital national interest kind of thing. But I'd rather, I think, stick a smaller vessel in there than a bigger gray vessel, have that come in closer. So if you can get the standoff range of the gray vessel and use something to get you most of the way in, that's much smaller, much more maneuverable. Is it still under threat? Absolutely. That's kind of what we get paid to do. Uh, but you try and limit your exposure so that you can get something ashore, open things up, and it probably in conjunction with something like uh, what we described earlier, B-22 landed force on foot to help clear an area and be able to tamp something down to at least maybe secure what we call a littoral penetration point uh, to be able to get other things ashore and be able to start expanding that bridgehead ashore. Okay. Uh, are there other questions out there, or have we... Connected everyone. Okay, we've got one here. I think I've exhausted the connection, connecting conversation. Hi, sorry, Greg Kaczynski from Raytheon. Uh, what type of avionics suite, uh, given that other question that was up front, do you envision on these uh, connectors and also any self defense weapons? No self defense weapons. Uh, avionics suite, I'm not sure. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, your company is actually providing some of those options. <laughs> hence, the, hence the question, um, or at least offering the opportunity. That's very much on our mind, uh, in particular with the J-35. Uh, the capabilities of that aircraft are just astronomical, uh, and, but how do you get that information down to the operating forces? Uh, you know, that, that is a very difficult problem, something we're very heavily focused on right now, um, to be able to get that information out. Uh, but our, you know, all of the things that we do we try and take the holistic picture of, well, how do you operate with your aircraft? How do you communicate with them? How do you maintain situational awareness? One of the things we're working on right now uh, for long range raids in B-22s, if it's six, eight, 10 hours in the air, you know, the change, the change of the situation, you know, the situation doesn't remain stable. Uh, it's gonna be very different from when you originally took off in the last update you got when you're short. So we're looking at ways to collaborate looking at what 18th Airborne Corps is doing, looking at a lot of different options to see, okay, how do we do airborne command and control uh, amongst the people in that force that are going on that long range raid, for lack of a better way of putting it, 
uh, to be able to communicate, maintain situ awareness, understand the changes on the ground, and be able to adjust uh, and pass orders, okay, here's what we're gonna do now uh, in those aircraft. So all of those things we're working on. Um, do I have answers for them right now? Absolutely not. But uh, technology is moving pretty quick, as you well know, and uh, it's something we're focused on, we're looking at, and uh, you know, we have to make sure we stay at the forward edge of that technology. Okay, uh, I think one more back here. Sir, on the um, subject of connectors, you were talking briefly about a catamaran. You mentioned uh, a catamaran. And it brought to mind the uh, Navy's INLS system. And I wondered if some of the capabilities that you were considering uh, in terms of uh, getting the assets from ship to shore were they going to be organic, meaning were they going to be Marine Corps assets only, oh. or were you considering partnering with uh, the Navy, for example? And if so, uh, had the INLS system been considered at all, possibly, I know how slow it moves, I, I actually attended, um, supported a, um, a training uh, exercise, a Freedom Banner, a few years ago, in which the INLS was implemented, but with modifications, might that be an opportunity uh, for consideration? Well, you'd have to ask the Navy that. If it's a vessel, they own it, and we're partnered with them very much so. I mean, that's how they get us ashore. Um, if it's a vehicle, we own it. Uh, it's probably a very simplistic way of looking at it, but no, we're, none of these connector options we're looking at are things that we would actually own ourselves. Uh, you know, we don't have the craft masters, we don't have the people who would be able to operate those kind of things. As far as the INLS, You'd have to ask the Navy on that one because you just went right past me. So, <laughs> uh, so the, it's the I forget what the I stands for, but the Navy Lighter Ridge System is what improved. Uh, okay. Yes. Right. So it's a system of barges and other uh, craft that from which you take equipment off of a larger ship and, and get it ashore. Yeah, that's the Navy owns all of that. Right. Exactly. Uh, I've seen it demonstrated, but that's very. The, I misunderstood your question. The ILS, I've seen it demonstrated, but it's very slow. Uh, obviously, sea states have to be very, very calm, uh, and that's in a permissive environment when they actually put those, push those things ashore. So, my question, uh, thank you. My question focuses on using it as a as a model, and possibly uh, making improvements to it. Um, oh, we certainly are having those kind of discussions. That's we'd like to have that done. Uh, but one of the things we talked about is the Navy has, you know, pretty significant issues facing right now fiscally, and so I think their options are getting fairly limited to what they can do, uh, because that, the, you know, ship construction, as a matter of fact, they they can't build all the ships that they want to build, let alone the ships that we want them to build, and uh, so that's, I mean, they're, you know, we're very constrained times right now, and uh, but any ways we can find to improve things, to find out better ways to do things, we're all about it, and uh, you know, so far in our discussions with the Navy, they are too but within limits, uh, within fiscal limits. And, uh, you know, because like I said, they, they have much bigger fiscal problems than we do. We can't even imagine the ones they have. Sir, hi, George Nicholson again. You referred to the joint high-speed vessel and also looking at using other platforms. I know that the original requirements for the joint high-speed vessel and the LCS had as a threshold in it that it would be able to support the 53 helicopter or the V-22. Those were knocked over to objectives. I brought this up at the Surface Navy Association a couple of years ago, and the PEO ship said, that's not a requirement we don't structure. Are you all looking at now with the new innovative concepts? looking what it would take to modify, particularly the deck of a larger LCS, like the Independence, particularly to be able to resupply it with a V-22 or to use it as, a, uh, as a, an FOB or a lily pad. Yes, and, uh, and I believe the Navy's looking very hard at those also, and of course it's more important that they look at it than we do, uh, but one of the things that I have, my understanding is that the Navy's looking to get V-22s as a potential replacement for the COD. Whether they'll do that, I don't know. I've seen you know, some reference to that in articles a couple other places. Um, so you, know, you brought up the, the idea that V-22 is showing itself to be a lot more capable than a lot of people thought it was. It's going beyond our expectations. Well, I just saw an article earlier that there's a lot of different countries looking to get V-22 now, and the cap of the article, the end of the article said, now it's cool to have a V-22. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, what, I, what I do know that is as this thing proves itself more and more capable, more and more people are gonna to wanna to use it, 
And that means it has to have platforms that can actually land on and operate off of. And it's both weight and heat signature, as you probably well know. And uh, so both of those are issues for the JHSV and the, I believe the LCS. I haven't looked as much at the LCS. But I think there's also a fair amount of experimentation going on to see if there are uh, military sea wolf command platforms that also might be able yes. to be uh, V-22 certified and uh, again, expand the utility of some of those for, for additional operations. Absolutely. Um, okay, are, we, are there any other burning questions about amphibious connectors? Okay, well, um, well we, thank you all very much for coming. Really appreciate you taking the time and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care. Thank you.